Hey everyone, welcome back to our Sip and Solve series. So for those who are joining us for the first time, this is where I get to share learnings from all the work we've been doing with our clients utilizing our data, analytics, and capabilities to ultimately assess risk, and all the while enjoying a beverage. Who doesn't love that? I'm having green tea today and hope you're enjoying something as well. So uh, my name is Lee Mao. I'm a product manager here. My product area of focus is commercial fraud. And today, no surprise, we're talking about fraud. Um, really, I like to continue. I like to consider this uh, today's session as a continuation as my previous uh, Sip and Salt series. Who those that did attend last year during the National Fraud Week on combating digital fraud. Um, if you missed it, I, I know we're going to have. I want to rewatch. I know we're going to have a link available to you at some point. So um, I'm going to quickly go over the next two slides, really as a refresher to to on what we chat about in the last video, because really, as I mentioned, it's a continuation, right? So. Um, you know, I always like to like to start with understanding how big the problem is. So we all know there's a massive amount of data uh, that fraudsters have access to, to today. And data is gold and they have a ton of it. This is important because it's one of the reasons why we're seeing some of the increase in the trends we're seeing. So on the very top left hand corner, what we've seen is 4.4 million identity theft victims in the U.S. in 2018. 4 billion in losses due to account takeover fraud on the right there. And really they're ultimately using um, data that they stole to create identities during the account opening stage, which is why you're seeing about 3.4 billion in a new account fraud losses. In our last video, um, the focus was really on implementing business verification at a minimum as a baseline layer to your um, multi-layer fraud strategy. So it's a great place to start, either manually reviewing or through API. And reviewed a number of different data elements. Some of them I have up here on the screen um, that you should be included as part of your business verification beyond just name and address. So things I've touched on was business to owner, uh, business to consumer linkage, social media to identify knockout rules using geolocation data as well as technographics and email right so um, today we'll talk more about how these elements are still critical but will probably be less effective by itself if you're under attack by a third-party fraud so as we saw in the first slide that i mentioned with how big the problem is right so we've seen an increased identity theft and four and four billion in losses due to account takeover fraud. Today, I really want to narrow that focus and help you think differently in how you tactically could build a better fraud strategy to solve one of the growing fraud types I mentioned previously, and that's third-party fraud. So before we can solve that problem, though, I, we, I truly believe it's critical we start to understand what type of fraud you're facing, because doing so will provide two things, right? Uh, one of the first things that we provide is the ability to distinctly classify the type of fraud occurrences because doing so will help you confirm the underlying behavior of the fraud. Now, the underlying behavior of the fraud is important because it helps you establish a custom tailored strategy to detect that same type of fraud moving forward. Um, second point really is, is each type of fraud may require you to create a slightly different strategy. So understanding that type of fraud will help you also understand what type of data, analytics, um, and the capabilities you could be should be utilized in effectively solving that specific fraud occurrences. Uh, first party, third party is definitely differences, and you want to be using different tools um, to solve these specific type of fraud. It's always about finding the right tool for the right job. So in front of us right now, um, I have three common third uh, third party fraud types that I've I've heard quite a bit. Um, first one is loan stacking. So this is multiple credit lines being exhausted and payments are stopped simultaneously. So I really view active loan stacking as the more serious issue if you're unable to solve the second and third type of fraud uh, mentioned below, really around the identity. So I mentioned account takeover already. So this is when fraudsters gain access to account that doesn't quite belong to them. You may hear or see fraudsters really res resurrect dormant businesses by attaching their own identity to the business. So you have a legitimate person or business owner. Well, I would say a legitimate in terms of identity. So they have um, that identity established, the real identity uh, tied to, say, a fake business or a dormant business. Now, that thing boils down to kind of the last uh, fraud uh, type I mentioned here is that synthetic ID. So fraudsters using a real person's name 
um, SSN, but associating with possibly a different address altogether. I've even seen that address being used in a hotel, for example. Now, that's just one scenario. It's different types of synthetic ID fraud, and we're definitely seeing that within uh, businesses as well. So synthetic business identities. We all know that um, there's a lot of business information out there that's publicly available. So that makes it um, easy and easier for someone to perpetrate as a business. And the fraud loss that we're seeing on the commercial business side, it's, it's much larger, right? You're seeing more volume on the consumer side, but from the commercial side, you're going to get hit for larger losses. And that sounds, into, from a fraud pers- fraudster's perspective, that's really the right target they're going for. So some of the key challenges with these type of frauds is that traditional fraud models are just not very effective uh, because uh, these identities are essentially hybrids of real and fake identification. Uh, synthetic IDs are just not detected by anomaly or common fraud detection tools or controls today. They really show up as your best customers a lot of times because fraudsters, as I mentioned, um, they're specifically engineering profiles to have very strong credit scores and waiting, patiently waiting to cult- cult- uh, cultivate them over time to gain that higher credit limit or loan amount. The impact to you is that it's increasing the propensity for higher fraud losses uh, to your portfolio when they eventually bust out, right? Um, There's no really silver bullet to identify this type of fraud. We do see a need for deep, trended data with advanced analytics required to track that behavior and identify these type of frauds. In the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about how you could have a chance at really solving that problem. So I'm going to cover this slide too quickly because I used it in the last session. This is where um, a strategy I shared in the last video where you compare the application of information against um, the things, the data that we do have on file, um, barrels like Experian, right? So the more you're able to verify, corroborate, or link things together, the stronger your trust should be that this is a legitimate business and applicant. Now, against third-party fraud, this approach, while still important, is no longer as effective or scalable. So you need to start thinking about the next phase where you're bringing in more analytical intelligence that I've mentioned to bring in all the disparate pieces that, in an automated way. So our intention is to, by pulling this together, we can start to build a very clear identity of a business. So here's a really great illustration of all the different layers to be considered as part of your overall layered approach. So by taking a layered approach, you can have additional potential fraud trigger events which are actually leading indicators to help you look at the application a little closer before you let them through the door. Um, it's, it's, it's almost – well, it's essentially trying to introduce friction in the potential bad guys you're seeing and, and letting the, the ones you know are good guys quickly through the door. So identity isn't clear-cut. It's a combination of multiple multitudes of different attributes, and it's about the relationship between these attributes. So we have a solution today called CrossCore. It's a single platform that allows you to access all of the capabilities that I've listed here on the screen today, as well as ML models you could access that allows you to quickly adjust and tune your strategy from, uh, in real time with fraud, and also a decision layer to bring all the capabilities together. Now, all these layers makes the fraudster's job much more difficult, and you know they're looking for the path of least resistance. So the idea is that you start to combine something that they have. Uh, so that would be, say, something like a device. So common questions we want to be able to answer part of the device is, have we seen this device before? Or have we seen them used as a device? Are they used in other online applications? What type of device is it? Um, is the device running an emulator? So fraudsters will use emulators to make an Android device look like a phone device. So this is very suspicious uh, information, right? There's also something called OCR, optical character recognition, that can recognize text and images. So when you collect a document right now, um, if you're not utilizing this technology, you're probably relying on a person reviewing the document to help um, to review that document themselves to verify that, right? Ultimately, um, this... By moving it to an automated way, you would improve that client uh, experience because manual intervention I do feel like as a way to introduce friction. So this should help you answer questions like, is this business business license legitimate? Um, Is the Secretary of State filing legitimate? Or even this passport legitimate? You combine something what they have with something that they are. So think of um, behavior-based solution. So that's under, um, so that would be under, say, um, the first device assessment, um, uh, first layer that I have on this slide here, right? So think of behavior-based solution. This is a person filling out the application. Are they copy and paste a lot of data? 
because that's indicative of fraud. Are they spending more time on a very difficult field, as this SSN, for example, that's outside of really industry benchmark? Are they all tabbing on their uh, laptop or their keyboard or not? So as you start to build in then um, uh, the decision layer on top of the attributes that I've mentioned are something that they have, something that they are. So when you start to pull them together, you say, hey, if they're using an emulator and the device configuration is some type of foreign language and there's a velocity of activity over time and the person is doing a lot of copy-pasting and the email associated has only been around, say, a couple hours, now to start to go, hey, that's that's pretty suspicious. So if you start to see that there are red flags then, right, you can start to then intro introduce friction into the application process. So a potential friction you could do introduce is a step up authentication. So this is when you bring in something that they know. So things like, um, you know, what type of mortgage payment does the potential business owner have or what's their last address, for example. So I'm sure a lot of you have answered these type of questions during the account opening process. So this is an opportunity to incorporate something like the experience knowledge IQ as part of your overall fraud strategy. The idea is then you start to bring in something that they have, something that they are, something that they know, and then uh, string along by a decision layer. Then you could be more effective ultimately at trying to identify third-party fraud. So why right here, I, I do have right all of the different elements. So we're looking for indicators, ultimately. Red flags or knockout rules during your account opening process. Here's a very simple flow of some of those data sources and tools that be used to evaluate some any of your incoming business. The fraud data sources um, that I mentioned on the bottom there um, combine also with probably information you're using from credit. Right, and then combine that with, say, the document verification, the social media information, the device ID, the behavioral things, and the one-time passcodes, right? Um, then you're able to bring this together, incorporate into some type of scorecard or strategy workflow, uh, similar to how I've kind of outlined here. And then, as I mentioned, to be even more advanced in that, you can even start leveraging supervised and unsupervised machine learning techniques to continually improve that fraud detection over time. The goal also is, well, a lot of it's trying to eliminate that false positive. Because again, the idea is you want to let all your good consumers through the process easily, but then throw up, but then throw up red flags to need to um, have a population that you're viewing and referring, but ultimately you want to still have a quick decision for those as well. So our goal or reason for doing this for the small business is to create the most accurate decision and quickly the most accurate as quickly as we can. So for you as a lender, we want to provide a place for you to manage your entire fraud and identity portfolio in a single platform, reduce the complexity in, in eliminating the burdensome of your IT team that have to implement all the different data capabilities and, and you also have to bring a decision layer on top of that. So the complexity of that, trying to reduce the amount of complexities to it, and also have a way for you to adjust the decisioning strategies on the fly so that you can reduce your outsourced or manual review rates and fraud rates. And then, and then also experiment more easily with new fraud and identity service as we make them available in our platform. Again, the, the idea is to implement a strategy where you could bucket the majority of your applications into the auto approval, auto decline decision. And that's what you see on the very left, right? So under decision types, you see the very red bucket, the auto decline, and then the, the green bucket on the very bottom towards auto approval. So we're trying to fill up those, those buckets, uh, the majority of your application population in those buckets. So I would say a goal to strive for Right, it's only have to manually review about eight to ten percent of your overall application population. So then that would be in the eight to ten population should kind of sit in that middle, right? Your decline refer review and then a, a approve refer review. Manually your team should have uh, manually, manually, when they review this process, your team should have essentially a 99% confidence that once they spend about 30 to 60 minutes investigating, they can readily identify that this is a fraudulent application or not. Now, you know, I, I think the simple thing is, you know, why are we putting so much effort into this process? Because I think we should have to keep in mind the customer, our end customer, because we want to improve that customer experience, and that's the entire focus of what we do, right? We want to protect the good consumers and small business to help them stay healthy and profitable. We want to reduce fraud coming through the door up front so we can eliminate the cause associated after the fact when you lose out on, on the money that you're lending to them or the goods that you're, you're providing to them as part of a sale, right? So with fraudulent activity through our customer 
uh, customer life cycle, we do want to reduce that operational cost and loss. It then allows your business to shift uh, your resource focus to really growth and marketing. And as a good fraud technology and strategy, um, as a good fraud technology data analytics partner, we want to easily help you to meet and exceed regulatory requirements with explainable, stable, and predictive outcomes and process. The end goal is for all of us to share in the success of our customers, and we are here to help them and find the capital they need to build a successful business and financial ecosystem that we all um, work in. So. You know, that was a quick 15 minutes. Our time is up, but if you have any questions, always love to talk to you more. Um, we have more sip and solve sessions. Please reach out directly either to your AE. We have a link, a couple links up to as well that will help you to send messages directly to us. Always happy to, uh, to be able to speak and meet um, each and every one of you, so feel free. Don't hesitate. Please reach out.